The motion is, the House believes that if resilience had real economic and societal value, then decision makers would be implementing it already. Fred, Alexa, you're going to keep time. Thank you. Fred. Can I just place it here? You can if you want. Excellent. Good evening, friends. Uh, we are strongly uh, in favor of the motion. Uh, while our honorable, though combative colleagues to my left are charitable in, in intent, they're, they're sadly misguided. Economic value is revealed by the choices made by decision makers related to the optimal level of utility offered by alternative options. When making decisions, people choose to maximize their own welfare. The prospect that people, cognizant of the stresses and shocks that threaten to decrease, decrease their welfare, would not choose a resilience approach is irrational. And while individuals may be driven by emotional and economically irrational behavior, while that is acknowledged, a society would not act in a manner counter to maximizing its welfare. Resilience presumes that a society would incur the cost of addressing risks of extremely low probability, the 100-year storm, which is economically suboptimal. It assumes a willingness to forego present value for potential future gain. Consequently, it's only in the wake <coughs> of catastrophe when society has demonstrated the willingness to incur the costs of resilience, diagnosis, and design. And even that commonly has not led to a willingness to incur the costs of resilience building. And we see this evidence again and again. We see this evidence in New York, in New Orleans. Hopefully we won't see this evidence in Cape Town. But we haven't seen the willingness to actually invest beyond, beyond the diagnostic phase to actual implementation of resilience. Oh. 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 Study, <laughs> study. <laughs> While it is worthy charitable intent, and we appreciate your enthusiasm for this charity, <laughs> It is valued only by those in a position to be charitable, which is because their economic welfare is secure. Thus consider who, for instance, is investing in resilience, philanthropic foundations. The Rockefeller Foundation, where I formerly served, funded the City Water Resilience Framework, funds the 100 Resilient <coughs> Cities Network. The Lloyd's Register Foundation is funding the Resilience Shift, a philanthropic organization. Institutions with a public charitable intent. You need to get that a bit closer. Bit Similarly, <laughs> uh, we see those institutions most engaged, the World Bank, USAID, the Swedish International Development Agencies, all with a public mandate to deliver a charitable purpose. Similarly, only the risk takers, innovators, and first movers are making private investments in this space. One minute, thank you. Only those willing to lose money see value in a resilience endeavor. Clearly, if resilience had real economic and societal value, those decision makers, private and public, would be investing in it and implementing it already. Thank you. <laughs> Great to see the team support there. <laughs> it's overwhelming. I was, almost, I was almost moved to tears there, Juliet. Thank you very much. Ruth, you get the, op the opportunity for your sort of riposte, your perspective, please. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I want to say that this uh, motion is fundamentally flawed and arrogant. I have to say that was a hugely arrogant set of statements to make. Uh, <laughs> number one, resilience has value, and number two, uh, and number two, decision makers are already implementing resilience. And I'm going to look at this in three levels. One is the human level, the next is the social level, and the, and the third is that corporate level that you so uh, so clearly dismiss. So, at a human level, we are um, inherently resilient 
as, as individuals. What is, it, what is it that makes us human? We have families, we love each other, we, we are grow, raised in communities, we save, we save for the future, we have faith, many of us have faith and we um, understand that we don't always understand what's happening in the future. We don't have risk registers for our own lives, but we have fundamental things that we do to be resilient. And we, and we um, embrace arts and culture and things which have no value, which you couldn't monetize, but we, uh, nevertheless we invest our time and money into it. At the second level, in society, we have constructed our society for balanced investments. On the opposition team, I think we have a regulator, and a regulator is put there through our taxation system in order to, to bring about balances in the system. If you go back in time, you look even back to biblical times, to Pharaoh's dream of seven years of famine, what happened? They put aside their harvest to prepare for the unexpected in the future. If you look at the concepts of sabbatical in the Bible, you see that every seven years you would forgive all debt you would forgive all, or, uh, and, your, and all your um, crimes would be removed. These are concepts of resilience which go right back to the beginnings of, of um, civilization. If you look to the Lisbon um, earthquake that happened um, so many years ago, you will see that the response to the Lisbon earthquake came through... Um, through society implementing actions through number one, the, the army, which is in itself uh, an investment in resilience for a country, and number two, the church, which again is an investment in resilience. So these social constructs have been with us throughout time. Uh, look at our modern day society, we have a health system which is, provides a social welfare net which you wouldn't invest in if you were only thinking of yourself and an education system which takes his children and gives children the tools to be resilient to do the things, what, what is resilience? It's to anticipate, to monitor, to respond and to learn and we, equip, we equipped every one of our citizens to do that through taxation and through investments that we make collectively as a society. If you look at things like the cabinet office in the UK, they're making resilience decisions against highly um, unlikely events and in Switzerland I believe they have bunkers where every single citizen will be provided for in the event of un some unlikely unplanned circumstance. Then I want to raise this to the corporate level which you so willingly dismiss and look, look at this foundation itself which is, which is born from private capitalistic intent 250 years ago and even Arab which is based on six principles outlined by its founder, one of which should be to make a reasonable living but the other five are fundamentally resilient principles about how you should go about doing business. Well said. <laughs> Businesses, <laughs> organisations, I want to say organisations which maximise profit do not, do not survive. They, they don't survive. I sit on a board at a, uni on, at a university and we have a risk register. If you remove the left-hand column, which is risks, and just looked at the responses, they're all resilience responses. It is inherently a resilience tool that we are we're using at board level, and a board level has a legal responsibility to think about the sustainability of the organisation. So again, resilience is built into the very fabric, the very fabric of the way that we construct capitalism. I finally want to say, I want to tell a joke about engineering, because this is the problem of engineers. This, this whole debate has been constructed by engineering thinking, and I have to say. My father was a surgeon, and my father said, what's the difference between an engineer and a surgeon? He says, a surgeon kills people one at a time. Right? So engineers... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So modern society... That the lack of resilience that we have discussed You've today, the that, that, <laughs> that is the basis of this motion, is a result of engineering arrogance. And that engineering arrogance has created a change in technology which has made that society inherently unresilient. And it's, so the challenge here is not that society is unresilient or decision makers are unresilient, but that engineers have created systems which have no resilience in them. So my challenge here is, is this delusion of, of, of that, our, that engineers have that they should be able to know and predict everything. And I'm putting the, the, the question back to you and saying, here's a challenge for you. All the decision makers are looking to you to give us the tools to, to keep resilience going in this inherently unstable si system of systems that, you've com uh, that you have created. So I, I fundamentally disagree with the motion, and I think the, the uh, response to the motion lies in the hands of the people in this room to put it right. Thank you. Oh, oh, it started. <laughs> I'll allow you each an immediate sort of one-liner response, and then I think we'll open it up to a couple of questions, if that's okay. So. Fred, 
I saw smoke coming out of your ears, <laughs> and I don't think you're an engineer. Thank you, Mark. My new friend, uh, dear colleague Ruth, unfortunately must resort to personal attacks to try to sway the audience because the substance of her argument is, is faulty. What makes us human, personal spiritual gain, does not translate to a willingness to pay for long-term resilience, to invest in actions that would reduce a low probability, high-risk future scenario, and to equate the purpose of the Lloyd's Register Foundation with a corporate intent is fundamentally misguided. As a foundation, Lloyd's Register Foundation has a philanthropic and charitable intent and thus is willing to incur the cost, but no other part of the economy is willing to incur that cost because there's not a recognition of the fundamental economic value by decision makers. I think that's one of the longest sentences I've ever heard <laughs> in the English language, but that, but that was a I good, thank you. A you didn't actually, no. You, so Ruth, you get a chance to counter that. Uh, I'm countering Fred's original um, statements, which I made extensive notes on, I would have to say. Fred said that society doesn't do irrational things. Now, let's look at collectively society's decisions. Donald Trump, Brexit. <laughs> There, there are many examples where society does irrational things. Individually, we also do irrational things. We smoke, we make bad decisions, we, we get into fast cars, we live in London, all. Uh, it's a pretty good life you've got. <laughs> <laughs> I, share it for a while. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. These, but these, so these are, these are not. I mean, just listen to the language there. High probability, high risk intent or something. Who talks like that? Engineers talk like that. The rest of us get on and live happy, resilient, loving lives, <laughs> building, so building social networks. So this rationality is a false god. It, is, it isn't the way any of us live. You know, we, we have models and, and, we, and we make votes and we ask, um, and we do invest in our tax system. And the foundation is a relatively recent thing. The business which the foundation sits on is 250 years old and has made a profit through that time, has made a good old corporate profit it just decides to invest that profit into charitable works, which is a, a business decision it makes, not a, a fluffy decision it makes. Very, uh, could we have a round of applause for that? I don't <laughs> but on both sides, we've started really well. <laughs> so Juliet, y you've got the benefit actually of, of hearing the, you know, the the fire's starting to catch hold. So, <laughs> it may be. <laughs> Let's see how we get on. Juliet. Thank you, Mark. So, I'm doubting right now the, the wisdom of going to do this debate. <laughs> so, as the technical director of the Resilience Shift, I genuinely doubt that the value of um, resilience is real. <laughs> Decision making and not investing in it already. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the things I want to pick up on are the, the drivers as to why we do make decisions. And we make decisions where things are easy, where things are obvious, where things are evident, and where it's very clear why you're prioritising your decision. Uh, and my argument as to why the value of resilience isn't real is because none of those things exist. It's not easy, it's not obvious, it's not evident and there's no way of demonstrating why it should be prioritised. So just to pick up on some of those drivers, a, a small example for the people who were here yesterday, there was a lot of discussion, there was a fire alarm in the hotel where many people were staying. So yesterday evening, I went to bed and I had my grab bag ready, I knew where my hoodie was, I was ready for that fire because it's the thing that's just happened. And that's what drives a lot of decision making. For sure, at the moment, many infrastructure owners, operators around the world are looking at their, their bridges that were built in the 1960s because it's high, it's at the top of everyone's minds. So, so the things that have just happened are, are things that really drive decision making. In the UK at the moment, we made the, um, the very rational decision to, to Brexit. So we're, we're being driven by productivity and growth and what does the UK look like post-Brexit. So that's very real, it's a clear driver for decision making. It's not intangible, it's not difficult to grasp like, like resilience is. We have the challenge of short-term cost, 
short-term profits, return on investment, and shareholder value, the, the cost of bills to, to bill payers, all of those are things, really tangible, real things that do drive decision making. We make a lot of our decisions certainly in the, in the UK and in other sort of de developed economies around efficiency and, and reducing waste. And if you put that, that can be parametrically or, or diametrically opposed to resilience, which really is about redundancy. So again, it comes back, is that a rational decision to, to build two of everything as opposed to going through efficiency, reducing waste, adopting the lean principles, which have, produced, which have proved very successful in the past? And I think the final thing that really genuinely drives decisions is it, it needs to be easy. And I talked when, when I gave my um, introduction to Resilient Shift yesterday, we used this phrase of VUCA, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world that we live in. None of those are very easy things to understand. So how can you make a real decision around volatility, uncertainty, complexity? It doesn't mean anything to the people who are making the decisions. And I genuinely think we, to make a shift in resilience, we have to be realistic around this. And if we don't understand what is driving people's decisions, we never will convince them to make the shift towards resilient decisions, and we're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. The gauntlet is well and truly laid down now. So, <laughs> Paley. What can you do with that? Here we go. Uh, well, to start, I think that the speakers on my right have had too much wine, because I think that they're slightly delusional. <laughs> um, look, I mean, I think to start with the first speaker, in terms of a public mandate, to say that decision makers don't have a public mandate is just ludicrous. So many decision makers do have a public mandate. If you look at government decision makers, that's exactly what they have to do. So. Yeah, and I mean, I think that many charitable organisations would choke if they heard the, the, the arrogance of which you spoke. Um, and what I will soon prove is that the low probability is simply not true either. There's a high probability in the world that we live of shocks and stresses, and that's, that's crucial to resilience. So the second speaker, her example of Brexit is, is a perfect example of isolationism and how that doesn't help you in the global world of interconnectedness in which we, we now live. Um, so, and, and her example of VUCA and easy, the point is we don't live in an easy, easy future and we need tools to know how to deal with that. That's what decision makers need and that's what resilience provides. So this is a new area. Resilience is, 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 is new to many people, but that doesn't mean it doesn't hold value. Um, it's also something that's for the world system as a whole and it's something that we all need to take on board. Um, the de de defining resilience is important because it's about the whole system, it's about what all of us are doing, not just one aspect, and it's about shocks and stresses. And I think we've seen that uh, in so many examples recently. The fact is, we're in a globally connected world. What happens in one area impacts on another. The drought that we've experienced in Cape Town is partly due to climate change and rising temperatures that are not in our control but they're pushing the storms away from our coast and we're not seeing the rainfall that we've, we've pre previously experienced. So we can't simply look to what we're doing and what's in our control. We live in an uncertain future, so we need to work together. And that's what, that is exactly what resilience speaks to. And we have, we have an urgency to act together. We can't simply go, this is in my best interests or I don't care what's in anyone else's interests because then none of us will succeed. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that the, the, the Cape Town drought tells us many things. Um, ooh. <laughs> um, it, people started out thinking that they could keep a narrow focus, but they soon realized that you can't. You have to start to embed resilience. And so I agree that the motion itself is flawed because we see res resilience happening in so many aspects um, already. And I think our role is to spread that knowledge. Uh, and frankly, frankly it's, it's simply short-sighted and, and ignorant to say that uh, <laughs> really it is, it's ignorant <laughs> to, <laughs> to say that, that, <laughs> that we can't avoid something because it's not easy. That's, that's the reality of our future. That's what decision makers are facing and they need tools and resilience is that tool. Have a so the gloves have now well and truly come off. Throwing around terms like arrogant and ignorant, is that really? 
Yeah, I think that's pretty much that's pretty that's that's, that's pretty much it. I think we start to get the beat of the yeah, issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. We haven't introduced fines yet to this panel. Anyway, I'm going to give you both an opportunity uh, to respond to each other in the spirit of uh, fairness and. So, uh, Juliet, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe you'd like to respond to, to those fine. personal attacks. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to be very dignified oh. <laughs> avoid any kind of name-calling. <laughs> and just to pick up on the comment about it being short-sighted and ignorant, I think the point that we're discussing is whether the value of resilience is real, not whether we're being short-sighted. And I've yet to hear from the other side any tangible evidence that the value of resilience is real other than in response to a shock that has just happened. And our debate is how do we encourage a change in decision making around resilience, whether or not that shock has happened for the no matter what. And that is where I maintain that value is not yet real. Okay. Um, Can we have a round of applause for that please? Yeah. Pretty job threatening, actually, but anyway, we'll keep going. So here we go. So I think something that's um, really evident is that the two speakers themselves are contradictory. So the first speaker says that there's a low probability of shock events happening in the future, that because there's a low probability, decision makers won't look to resilience for tools. But the second speaker acknowledges that shocks and stresses are happening all the time, but then says resilience doesn't give us the, the tools to, to, to work. But that's simply not true. And in a world where we've had heroes <coughs> across Europe, droughts in South Africa, it, decision makers need to look to more than just sustainable development. It's not just about you know, making a better life, but it's about saying how do we respond to shocks and stresses. And resilience gives us the tools through the frameworks, the lenses of saying how do we, how do we adapt and thrive, how do we transform in this new world era. And, and that's, that's the most important. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for that one? I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting drawn oh. this way, and then I'm getting drawn that way. You know <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm in the middle, but it's so convincing on both sides. It's unbelievable. So uh, Trevor is now going to give us his two penny worth. Trevor? Well, maybe a little more. Well, thank you, everyone, and a very good evening to you all. Um, we've heard some very uh, emotive and passionate things this evening with regard to the emotion of both teams, both this team and the B team on the other side there. So <laughs> what I would like to do is hopefully join them with me in actually looking at this uh, motion in a more dispassionate and objective way, which I believe will help you to understand why I understand it, why we understand it, I'd like to join you to join us at the end of this debate. Context is everything, and with resilience in particular. And I think what's important with resilience is that we recognise that we are on a continuum. Resilience is not fundamentally new, but there are new elements. Particularly at this point in history, we're at a really important stage where we have increasing uncertainty, increasing complexity, probably at the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution with AI, automation, etc., etc., which means we need to revisit what we think about resilience or where it goes. But it's not new. And what we're facing now is probably more than just a simple evolution, but probably a little bit less than a genuine revolution. So why do I say it's not new? It's very important to this motion, this question about whether it is new or not. This city of ours, the first time it became a tangible city, was some 2,000 years ago when the Romans turned up. They faced three existential challenges. They faced uh, civil defence with those awful uh, Roman Britons out there at the doors. They faced uh, a very difficult supply chain back to Europe. And they faced flooding. What they did, they thought about the interconnectivities, the interdependencies, how you could redress the resilience of those issues in combination by building a single defence which makes all of them together. Coming a bit closer to time, we're in the Royal World Register. And those great names, I assume they're the great names above us of some of the people that were here at the founding of what Lloyds did. 
They helped deliver resilience to the transportation uh, and economic services that this country and other com countries have benefited from in the past. By creating a register, by creating standards, by driving up resilience and saving lives and increasing prosperity. Coming close to, to home in terms of time, we've seen Australia, Australia decision making, decision making made a really tough decision about diversifying after the great drought, the great millennial drought. We've seen climate change, adaptation, and meditation. We've seen decision makers making really tough decisions on carbon budgets and progress on, on uh, adaptation, etc. And just to bring things even closer to home, in this country in 2014, primary legislation we introduced resilience into the water sector in a primary duty for my organisation of So what I'm saying is decision makers have, as per this statement, taken these decisions on resilience. And I think we need to recognise, appreciate and applaud that work. So if we go back, now of course all of those with the benefit of hindsight, you might say could be done differently, could have been done better. Uh, with our intellectualisation of resilience within this type of forum, I'm sure we have thanks and advice for those decision makers in terms of what they do. We need to recognise the effort and the boldness that they've done. So if you accept that resilience isn't new, and then you look at this statement again, and I'll read it out for you and I'll just finish it. <laughs> this House believes that if resilience had real economic, societal value, decision makers would be implemented already. I'm advocating they have done through history, they are now, and they will continue to do in the future. QED, I support this motion because this motion is factually correct. Okay. Oh, it's hotting up now. Very, very clever. Diego, let's see what you've got to. What, what have you got to offer there from the World Bank? <laughs> <laughs> we do credit sure. lending, and <laughs> well, I'm the I'm the last one. But uh, as I was reading that um, Lucy Goosey mambo jumbo statement, I wanted to concentrate on two critical words, and those are values and implementation. Uh, there's a lot of chit-chatting around the world on resilience and resilience here, resilience there. Uh, very difficult to, to implement. And first I need to correct uh, Mr. Bowles on, uh, on a fact on uh, basic economic theory. <laughs> <laughs> when we look at valuation, we are rooted in two fundamental uh, flood uh, concepts that are part of the expected uh, utility uh, theory. The first one is rationality, when we make decisions. We are not rational human beings, and we've seen it over and over again. That's why we have externalities, negative externalities all over the place. The second one is that we make decisions based on perfect information. Also irrational, it doesn't exist, perfect information. You have asymmetries of information all over the place. So when you look at values based on those theoretical, uh, based on the theori theoretical principles, you're looking at valuing based on different set of techniques no? within, within cost-benefit analysis that they are based on this fundamental uh, theory and try to exert value from willingness to pay from individuals based on already a flawed uh, theory. Uh, there's sample evidence, on the, at least on the environmental side and the green side, that the willingness to pay is extremely low because uh, people do not have the, 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 the correct type of information to value these goods. So there's not really a lot of environmental value when, when you do this uh, uh, analysis. When resilience uh, comes in as a concept, then you, we have to start thinking of system of systems and analyzing values and extract values from a system of systems, which adds much more complexity to the, to the problem. Understanding and valuing interdependencies is extremely difficult. Then you get into this general equilibrium frameworks in economics to try and extract some values, and, and those are extremely difficult to assess. So assessing resilience dividend and assessing uh, values for this type of uh, exercises is fundamentally flawed. Um, if, if you don't do modeling, 
It's very difficult to implement resilience given all of this system-wide uh, interdependencies. So you have to get into sort of real modeling exercises with a lot of data uh, simply that doesn't exist to value or understand all the interdependencies and, and extract the value. My, my second uh, point on the implementation side is, I mean, the realities on the ground, on, uh, particularly when you look at institutions and politics, right? Uh, we live in a world where supposedly in resilience, everything is connected with everything else, right? So all the, all the silos that exist institutionally have to be broken. That process usually does not take place, even in the most developed countries, so it's impossible to realize this type of uh, interinstitutional uh, and intrainstitutional coordination. Uh, there are no incentives to collaborate at all when we look at uh, implementing these um, system-wide approaches. There's short-term visions. No? The politicians do not like <coughs> long-term planning, and resilience is all about the future and what may happen in the future. And, and politicians usually have, uh, look for the short term. Um, and, and when we get into, into aspects, again, of regulation and legal frameworks that are all basically developed and, uh, you know, in the 19th century and the 20th century in, in many countries, these are already um, institutions and instruments that are not really prepared to, to, to adopt or to mainstream resilience. And this, any process of reform will take, you know, 30 to 40 years, we see it in in any reform process in our countries uh, uh, in the in the water sector. So I'll finish. Uh, with that. Thank you. So um, your opportunity, Trevor, to you heard what Diego had to say. Did, that, did it make your blood boil, or did it resonate? Uh, as a regulator, we don't have. We're very confident. <laughs> <laughs> It's been said it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to my colleague Diego at the end there. Uh, and I think uh, a, a short history on uh, old strata economics was very useful, I'm sure, for some people. Uh, and, uh, somewhere. Uh, maybe at some time. Um, but I remember having uh, dinner, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, with a very senior uh, Tory uh, MP, who was actually a cabinet minister uh, about that time. And he once said to me, that in his opinion, economists were more dangerous than terrorists. Uh, and obviously an opinion which I don't share. But I think it's very interesting when we hear the argument you put forward. And there is a new approach to economics. And particularly when I heard you talk about the lack of valuation and understanding and how these things act as a barrier, particularly with regard to environmental valuation. When you look at this motion, I think time and again we're seeing innovation not only in business, in commerce, in government, but also in terms of our approach to economics and how we can make the system work to help us make the right decisions. And that's what's fundamental and that's why I support this motion. Because actually decision makers are listening to this new paradigm of evidence which justifies and supports resilience and that's why they're making those tough decisions now and we need to help them make those decisions even better in the future. Thank you, thank you, Trevor. Another, the sentences are getting even longer. It's amazing. Diego, here you go. This is your chance. <laughs> this is your moment. I very much appreciate uh, my colleagues uh, also criticism of, or actually not a criticism, a praise for economics, particularly when it's uh, so valuable in regulation, as, uh, you know, in this country. Right? Um, there, there, there are interesting uh, innovations in, in economics and evaluation, but I think we are quite far from uh, actually being able to make rational decisions based on those uh, valuation exercises. Uh, particularly when you look again at uh, you know, non-market valuation techniques that are, have proven already to provide uh, a lot of uncertainty in the, in the values and very low values. Um, but even if we move from valuation and we get into the, for example, the financial realm. You know? In long-term financial investment strategies, um, I would like to have some certainty on my returns. I don't want to 
plan financially for something may happen at some point in time, and then I have to adjust, right? Because I'm discounting future flows, and I'm gaining revenues from that. And I want security in that. I want legal security in that. And I don't want that, none of this mambo jumbo of flexible approaches and flexible planning and flexible projects. I want certainty. That's my answer.